great pleasure to be here today and to um, talk about some of the research in this field. And today I want to address the question, what can genetics tell us about autism spectrum disorder? I come at this from a geneticist, so it won't surprise you that I think the answer is a lot. Um, but I'd like to detail why I think that. We're going to start off with DNA. Uh, DNA, of course, is the root of all genetics. When I was at school, I was taught that genetics was a book, that DNA was a book which contained information which you read. As I've come to understand genetics better, and I think there's still a great deal to be understood, I have realized that actually it is much better to think of DNA as a three-dimensional biological computer. Not only does it contain the information necessary to encode all of us, including the most complex organ in the, in the entire known universe of, of the brain, but also it doesn't just encode the information, it is the computer. It does the interactions, it does the, 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 the determination of when things are going to be expressed. And if we could truly understand how this amazing computer worked, we would be a lot closer to understanding really what humans are. I just want to give this little simple comparison here of just how amazing this feat of engineering is. Uh, if I was to go out and buy a Windows computer, it would be obsolete within three or four years. Um, that takes six gigabytes of data to actually run. If I was to take the human genome, that has now survived for, we think, tens or hundreds of thousands of years. And amazingly, is almost 10 times smaller than that of the Windows operating system and has the additional benefit that it self-generates its own hardware. So, what can this remarkable three-dimensional computer tell us about biology? Well, first we have to understand how this computer works. So at the base of it, you have the DNA. This is shown on the far left here, and this contains the nucleotides, the A, C, T, and G. And at its heart there, it is just simply data. But where it starts to get clever is that data, that DNA, is then wrapped around this protein called a histone. This histone can be modified, and it's modified according to the DNA which is wrapped around it, and that's where you start to get these interactions de uh, developing. Those interactions tell the DNA when to open, and when it opens, it can be transcribed, and that's what we're seeing in the third bit here, and this is what we call gene expression. In red in this diagram is where the information is contained. It's in the nucleotides in the DNA, it's in these tails to the histone protein, and then, once it gets expressed, it forms this mRNA, which then goes out of the nucleus into the, um, into the cell, where it forms a protein through a ribosome. This is really the only way that DNA has to interact with the cell. It can receive messages, but in terms of actually sending messages out, all of it comes through this mRNA to create proteins. So let's just extend this a bit further. If we start on the far left, we have this gene. This could be any gene. I'm going to say the example here of the gene P10. That's encoded in the DNA. We've seen the chromatin, the RNA, and the protein which come out of that. Those proteins go on to have functions which build into cells. Those cells interact to form tissues and organs. And eventually, that leads to the system in the human, which is where we can observe the phenotype, which is the clinical patterns which we see. On a very simple level, somehow that information contained in the gene traverses all of those different categories. As the information goes across, it is diversified and amplified. It starts off as a single molecule. It ends up as something observable in an entire human. I'm showing here a path of that information, and that path leads to autism spectrum disorder. At some point, it is distinct from the path leading to big heads, or macrocephalo, as we like to call it in pediatrics. We always like big Latin words or to seizures. Somehow those are distinct, although they start off with a common root because that gene causes all three. To give an example of this idea of diversification and amplification, I'm going to think about eye colour. A single molecule within me determines the fact that I have blue eyes. That information has been amplified from that molecule to the point where it's observable to everyone in this room to see in, in, in my eye colour, and it's also diversified because that also affects the colour of my hair and the colour of my skin. The same is true of these genes. They start off as a single molecule, but by the time you have these effects, it is widespread. And that's why we refer to these things as syndromes, because there are many different features. But that model's not complete. We need to add in the other effects. Firstly, there's regulation. All of these downstream categories regulate each other. If I was to, the coffee which I had before starting this talk is going to interact with my DNA at the chromatin level to change the gene expression in my body. 
at the bottom, we have an environmental effect here. Now, you can say that, that coffee would be an environmental effect. It all depends on my phenotype, about whether the phenotype caused me to regulate it or the environment itself. And I include stochastic effects here of randomness. Now, this is a very complex model, but I want to make one important point here, and that's this line. If you look at that regulation, if you look at that environment, neither of those really affect DNA. And this is one of the wonderful things about DNA. It is constant within us. I have the same DNA I had when I was conceived. And what that means from a key point of view is that if we're starting to talk about um, causation, then DNA is a wonderful place to start because it must have been there before I developed any symptoms of a, of a disorder or a trait like height. And so when we start thinking about causal processes, DNA and genetics is an extremely good place to start. And I would like to argue today that genetics is one very important entree into understanding the biology. To really dig into this, we need to know a little bit about genetics. This might be familiar to some in the room, but I want to make sure that everyone's sort of on board with what we're talking about here. When we think about DNA, within it there are variants, and these variants are what make each one of us different and unique. There are three different sizes of these. On the far left, we have a single nucleotide variant. This is where one base has changed to another one. Here, an A, C has changed to a T. Slightly larger than that, we have an insertion deletion, which we call an indel. Uh, that's where a little bit of DNA has been deleted or inserted. And that's, we have an arbitrary number of 50 base pairs driven by, the, by technology. And greater than 50 base pairs, we call this copy number variance. Same idea, deletion or duplication, but this time they can be much larger. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and identify these variants at a large scale inside the DNA of people with autism and their families. When we start looking at this DNA, we can actually start to make sense of it if it hits a gene. So here we're seeing a gene in the, in the human genome. The bits called exons, which are the big black bars, those are what go on to make a protein in our cells. Between those are the introns. At the start is the promoter and the five prime UTR. Those are regions which are important in the regulation of these, as are other parts of the genome. But I've highlighted here some of the key features. There are some bits of genes which are constant. For example, they always start with an ATG. Between an exon and an intron, you'll almost always find these same two nucleotides, the AG and the GT shown in the middle there. And they always end with one of these three codes at the end. I've called those the stop codons at the far end. And so basically, you have a start signal, you have a continue signal, and then you have a stop signal, which tells you when to, when to start making the protein, or stop making the protein. If we look at the SMDs and indels, there are three patterns where they can induce an early stop. The first one is a nonsense mutation. So this is where a single base is changed, and instead of encoding a bit of protein, it gives a stop signal too early. The next one is a frame shift. DNA relies on a pattern of three base pairs, and it disrupts those three base pairs, again inducing that same TGA stop signal. And here at the end, we have a splice site. If that splice site is lost, instead of stopping and going on to the next exon, we again induce a splice signal. The key point of all of this is that if we take one of these variants, we can predict that it's going to completely disrupt one copy of this gene. And that is a very, very strong signal in terms of looking at biology. When we think about variants, we think, we've thought about their size, we've thought about their effect, we also need to think about their frequency in the population. So all of us have genetic variants, but most of the variants which we're familiar with tend to be common ones. And I've shown this on the top left. These are common variants, we find these genetic variants in the entire population. They're present in the parents, they're present in the children, and by and large, they, they encode traits like height or even eye color. Sometimes they can be associated with disorders. The most common one, or most well-known one here, is the Alzheimer's locus, where a common variant explains about 30% of the heritability of Alzheimer's. On the far right, I'm showing a different pattern. These are rare inherited variants. They're not common in the population. They're very infrequent. But they are present in a, in a parent who transmits it to the child, and these, again, can lead to disorders. For example, Huntington's disease, which is a rare disorder, but a very serious one. At the bottom, I'm showing de novo mutations, the bottom left. These mutations are not present in either parent. They are only present in the child. They are a new, and that's what de novo means, mutation which has arisen out of the genome. 
These are extremely rare. In each one of us, there's only about 70 out of the 3 billion base pairs which we have. And on, on the bottom right, I'm showing the idea of a somatic mutation. This is that same idea of a new change, a new mutation, which happens um, after you've been uh, conceived, and this time it only affects a small part of the body. Cancer is basically a somatic mutation phenomenon. So why do we care about the frequency of these variants? It all comes down to evolution. So what I'm showing here, or natural selection, what I'm showing here is the frequency of the variants. So we just characterize them as being rare or common. On the far right are the common variants. On the left are the rare ones. On the, on the um, y-axis, we're showing the effect of these variants. As we go up, the variants having a big effect. Towards the bottom, it's having a very minimal effect. And this red line is the line of natural selection. If we're looking at a variant which is detrimental, which has a bad effect um, on, the, on the person, then if it becomes too common in the population, it won't be transmitted, and therefore it is forced to become rare. So the rarer a variant is, the more impact that variant can have on the person. And so if we want to find something of really significant effect, we want to be looking at the rarest of the rare variants. An example of that would be a de novo mutation. Here's one example of that concept. Fragile X syndrome is very penetrant. If you have it, you almost certainly will have the disorder Fragile X, but is also extremely rare in the population. If I look at another disorder where the effects of natural selection are maybe weaker, for example, schizophrenia, we get a different line. Because natural selection is having less of an effect, these variants can be slightly more common in the population. And over here, I'm showing a common variant seen in about 2 or 3% of the population, which has a weak but uh, important effect on causing schizophrenia. And again, it has to be under this line. Because schizophrenia has less of an impact in terms of natural selection, that line is a little bit higher. And then if I add another line, if we start thinking about variants which don't really have an impact on your ability to pass on your genes, for example, things to do with height, then you can find these variants have very, very strong effects and also are very common in the population. And I'd like to give here the example of a Chu syndrome, which is a syndrome which I suffer from myself. And it is so, it's so common that I guarantee there'll be other people in this audience who probably don't know it, but are suffering from it. So um, does anyone here, if they need to sneeze, who looks at a light to make them sneeze? So you are a Chu syndrome um, sufferers or, or beneficiaries. And this is a recognized dominant common variant. Uh, and the rest of the room thinks we're crazy, but um, it, it is a well-recognized phenotype. Now, because a Chu syndrome is not associated with difficulty in passing on your genes, it is allowed to be common in the population. In autism, where the, the impact of it makes it harder to, uh, to reproduce and have children, we see that these variants tend to be nearer the red line. And a variant which is going to have a high impact in autism tends to be very rare. So we're going to start off looking at de novo mutations. These are the rarest variants and therefore have the potential to carry the greatest effect. They are so rare that there's very little noise to sort through, and the signal stands out better, which makes it an easy starting point. The experiment I'm going to show you today for much of this data starts off with the Simon Simplex collection. These are 2,500 families which were collected specifically for, uh, really for, for this type of project. It was collected by the Simons Foundation, which is kindly hosting us today. And these families are special because they contain two parents who are unaffected, they contain one child who is affected by autism, and in most of them, an unaffected sibling. Now, that means that you have a family where you have the perfect case and control to start looking for these de novo mutations. We then use these families, and we analyze them with two genetic techniques. The first one is called a microarray, and we can use that to find the copy number variants, which are the very large deletions or duplications. We also then use the high throughput sequencing, which allows us to identify the very small single nucleotide or indel variants. So we're going to start off looking at de novo mutations found by both of these techniques. On the left, we have the loss of function variants. These are the ones which completely disrupt one copy of the gene. And these on the far left are found by SNVs and indels. On the right, with the five different bars, we see these copy number variants, these large-scale deletions and duplications. And they're split into five groups by the size, the, the largest ones on the far right, the smallest ones on the left. 
we are comparing the number of these de novo mutations in the cases, called here probands, or in the unaffected siblings in green. And you can see across the board, the purple bar of the cases is higher than that of the siblings who are in green. So what does this mean? Well, very simply, the siblings represent the neutral variation. All of us have de novo mutations. In the majority of us, they're not doing really anything important in terms of impacting our health. This is just the normal background, the neutral variation which makes us um, humans. It's the substrate of evolution. If you have autism, you, of course, will have that background as well. But on top of that, there will also be the de novo mutations which are carrying risk. And so the fact that we see this difference between cases and controls is a very strong signal that these de novo mutations are carrying risk for autism. And we can see here from this graph, we see it at the small variants and the large variants, and it becomes a more dramatic effect the larger the variant gets. So put simply, we have now found a category of variation which carries risk for autism. If we could just work out within this category which variants are in the red bit versus the blue bit, we now have a list of variants which are associated with autism. And the way we've been able to do that is by looking for these mutations clustering together. These mutations are so rare, the chance of seeing more than about two or three in the same place in, in a population who's not got autism is almost zero. Here, we have an example where at the top, we're seeing six genes with their gene names. So ARID1B is one of these genes. The genes are shown in blue. We then have two deletions shown in red, and then five of these very small loss of function mutations, which are shown in purple. And you can see that all of these line up on this one gene, ARID1B. And because we know how, how often we see these mutations lining up in the controls, this is extremely strong evidence that this gene, ARID1B, is associated with autism. And this, in the last, in the 10 years I've been working with autism, I would say that this ability to do this is the single greatest achievement we've made. To actually be able to go from looking at these large populations of individuals to get a list of the specific genes which are carrying risk has been a huge achievement. When we start combining cases together, we're now looking here at a population of 8,000, we can start to find lots of genes. At the bottom is a list of 65 genes, all of which we have a greater than 90% um, knowledge are associated with autism. If we go for the box on the far left, we now have greater than 99% confidence that these are associated with autism. So this creates an amazing substrate for trying to work out the biology. If we could just understand what these genes do and why these genes result in the same effect, we would basically have a working understanding of, what, of how autism occurs. We can also do the same with the copy number variants, the very large ones. And here we find eight distinct regions where we see these copy number variants coming together. I'd like to draw your attention to the ones um, called the 7Q11.23. That's the top red bar here. This is a particularly fascinating locus. When we found this region, it was a region which had already been associated with another disorder in humans. It was associated with a disorder called Williams syndrome. And what was known was that if you had a very large deletion at this Williams syndrome region, you would get Williams syndrome, which included having a heart defect called supravalvular aortic stenosis, some fairly severe neurological problems, but one really interesting characteristic of an increase in social engagement. So almost the opposite of autism. What we found here was the opposite. Instead of losing that section of DNA, we had an increase in that amount of DNA at the very same place, and this was now associated with autism. So within this region of DNA, there is something which is regulating our ability to engage socially and is, is a, I think, a, an important insight into what autism may be. It has been said that um, we see a lot of overlap between the genes we're finding and the genes which are seen in intellectual disability. And one concern of this has been that we're essentially identifying individuals with autism and intellectual disability rather than autism. I'd like to show this slide just to get across the idea that this is not necessarily the case. On the left here, we're looking at the copy number variants. You're seeing four different groups of people, a group with schizophrenia, a group with intellectual disability, or ID, a group with autism, and a group with controls. 
if it was the case that all of these just carried risk for intellectual, intellectual disability and autism and schizophrenia just happened to be comorbid alongside that, what you would see is a triangle pointing up very, very strongly with a slightly weaker triangle pointing towards autism and schizophrenia. Now, there are some examples of that. I would say the blue triangle in the top left really captures that idea. But other ones do not. If we take the 15Q, the top right, you can see it's going strongly towards autism, but not towards schizophrenia. If we take the, um, the one on the bottom left, we see the opposite effect. This time it's going strongly towards schizophrenia, but not towards autism. The point I want to make with this slide is that along with carrying risk for neurological problems, there is some degree of specificity towards specific disorders within this. And on the right, we see a, a, a similar concept looking at the very small mutations in single genes and asking the question, are they more common in the autism population than the intellectual disability population? Now, I'm not arguing that one of these genes is more important than the other, but simply the fact that there is a distinction and there is some meaningful impact on social interaction independent of intellectual disability, it seems to be emerging from these. And I think this is, it's very early days in digging into this, but I think it's a critical region we need to start thinking about. Recently, we've been trying to extend this. So the work I've shown so far has been focused very much on the region of the genome, which results in genes. Earlier, I talked about um, DNA as being a three-dimensional computer. The computation of that is carried on in the non-coding genome. And so we've been working with data created by the Simons Foundation to try and find a same de novo mutation signal in these non-coding regions. If we saw a signal on these plots here, we would see that red bar shifted strongly to the right. We do see examples of this. On the top right, we find the missense mutations show exactly that pattern we would expect to see. You can see the red bar shifts toward the right, which is towards risk in autism as opposed to the siblings, the unaffected controls. However, if we look in the non-coding regions, we see a very weakly significant effect on the intergenic one, which is the bottom here. But overall, we are not seeing those same effects in the non-coding regions that we've seen so far in the coding. This is a very small sample size, though, to be starting thinking about this. So the fact it's a negative result doesn't mean it will be negative when it gets bigger. I, I think this is just showing that we can start to think in the same way. We started thinking about what do we need to do to interpret these non-coding regions. In the coding regions, there's a very clear hypothesis. We want to look at the loss of function variants which disrupt one copy of the gene. In the non-coding regions, it is much less clear where this signal is going to lie. Will it be in the promoter region, which is key to the gene being transcribed? Will it be in the enhancer regions, which are what regulate when and where that gene is transcribed? Will the variants be conserved? Will they be in proximity to known ASD genes? Will they be regions which are accelerated in humans? We started thinking of all the different reasonable hypotheses we could put towards this, looked at combinations of them, and rapidly got to the stage where we found there were 66,000 um, different analyses we wanted to test. This plot here is showing all 66,000. What we want to see is dots on the right in the top right corner. What that would mean is that they were significant, as in statistically unexpected, and that's on the y-axis. And being shifted to the right shows that we found them in the cases rather than the controls. Now, encouragingly, we do find a cluster of dots just in that place we would want to see. When we look at those, they are not the non-coding regions. They are, once again, the coding regions. These are the de novo missense mutations, this time near genes involved in the synapse. So our take home from this is that we, we are approaching it in a way which we think makes sense. We are actually finding stuff which we know to be true in the form of these de novo missense mutations, but that right now, despite our best efforts, we are not seeing a non-coding signal which we can interpret. I think it would be near enough a miracle if we had seen it in 500 people, and it's very, very early days with this. But what this has done is force us conceptually to think about how this analysis will be done. We've spoken about rare de novo mutations. We're now going to go a little bit less rare towards the rare inherited ones. If instead of looking at de novo mutations, I do exactly the same plot looking for rare inherited variants, I can almost see no difference between cases and controls. From a practical point of view, we've not been able to identify any genes through these type of rare inherited variants alone. 
If I look at homozygous variants, so these are where instead of just one copy of the gene being disrupted, both copies are disrupted, a much more severe effect and a much rarer effect, we do again start to see a signal. Again, the signal is in the loss of function locations, and we see the same two to one difference between cases and controls. Exactly the same interpretation is here. The blue bar represents the neutral variation in the population. The red is the increased risk coming from autism. To date, there's been one gene which has come out of this, uh, this type of approach, and that's the gene BCKDK. This is a gene involved in the uh, transport of amino acids across the blood-brain barrier. And it maybe gives a slight hint that there might be a, a metabolic signal in, um, involved in some causes of autism. And then finally, we're going to look at common variants. These are the variants present in everyone in the population, but which we expect to carry a very, very weak effect. On the left is a plot which looks at these variants en masse. It's asked the question, do we see evidence of a signal shifting towards the cases than the controls? And the answer is yes, we do. In the cases, we see about 40% of the risk of autism is coming from these common variants. If we look in the parents, the risk is more like 20%, and the same is true in the unaffected siblings. On the far right, we have this concept of a pseudo-control. A pseudo-control is the non-transmitted allele from the parents. Interestingly, that allele still carries risk of autism um, due to the probability of, of passing it on. And to date, all the analyses which have tried to look at specific common variants in autism have relied on those pseudo-controls as the comparison said. And because those pseudo-controls carry risk, I think this is very much hampering our ability to find these. To date, we do not have a single genome-wide significant replicating common variant, but I think it is just a matter of time. And I, I'm hopeful in the next year or so, we're going to see some reliable common variants coming out of autism. The key question is going to be, do those common variants have the same effects on biology as the rare variants? If the answer is yes, then we have a fairly good unified model of autism. If the answer is no, then we're going to need to invest in both to really understand the full picture. So, in genetics, there has been something of a, of a rift. There are people on the rare variant side, of which I would count myself one, and there are people on the common variant side. Um, this has been driven by technology. You use different platforms to do identify rare variants versus common variants, which means, on a very simple stage, we end up competing for funding. This creates something of a rap battle with the, sort of, you know, the dissing going on. Of course, the genome is not the same. In the genome, these are all one and the same. And if we really want to try and understand what autism is, we need to take a more holistic view. We need to, to get rid of the rift and integrate all of it into a model. Now, it's not helped that we have very, very different ways of thinking about these. So we're going to go back to the 18th century here with uh, Gregor Mendel, a gentleman who was very interested in peas and maybe slightly less interested in his monastic duties. He described this idea of peas, of having short peas and tall peas. And you could actually work out the inheritance of this looking at a dominant or a recessive effect. This is an example here of a family with a dominant effect. The people in black are affected, and you can get the idea of there being a single genetic variant passed on, 50% chance of going to each, each child, and passed on to those. When we start thinking of rare variants, this is the model which springs to mind. And when I was at medical school, which is starting to seem like quite a long time ago, this was genetics. We didn't even really mention anything apart from this idea of rare variants. And the, the extent of my medical training in genetics was try and spot the dominant versus the recessive pedigree. There's a competing view, which started really from the, the very early days of the 19th century with Fisher, but I think was really popularized by Falconer, who I'm showing here. And in this, they say that genetics is a much more common variant phenomenon. There are multiple variants, each of individually small effect, which cumulatively result in a trait. So for here, let's imagine we're looking at height. If I was to line up everyone in this room, it would form a fairly nice normal distribution, just like we see here. And in quantitative genetics theory, you argue that the variants underlying that mirror that perfectly. If we take someone who's small, they're going to have variants which are sort of tending towards the small end. There's going to be an accumulation of those leading towards someone who's tall. 
most people hit towards the middle and have an average number of these variants. Now, on the face of it, these look like completely opposing worldviews. You know, one is a very, very clear pedigree. The other one is looking across an entire population, a lot of the work interestingly done on cattle. But if I was to show this differently, if I was to show something, let's imagine, say, um, bronchiectasis, which is a, a severe problem with the lungs. The normal population does not have bronchiectasis. They have variation, but they don't have it. If you have cystic fibrosis represented by this very, very, very big red arrow, that shifts everyone out of the normal distribution into this second distribution here, which might be bronchiectasis. Within that, though, there is variation. Not everyone with cystic fibrosis is equally affected. And some of that comes down to additive common variants. If I was to take the opposing view here of the quantitative genetic theory, we have an accumulation of risk variants in red compared with the protective variants in blue. If you cross a line, you are diagnosed with a disorder, and you start to get more to this case versus control idea. And so the point I'm trying to make here is they're really both reflecting the same underlying truth. It's just they are extremes of each model. One of them is based on lots of variants of tiny effects. The other one, those variants are there, but there's one variant of such big effect that overwhelms the two. Now, when we start thinking about autism, we find that we are the synthesis of these two. To the best of my knowledge, there is no genetic variant which is truly Mendelian, which can take you from anywhere in the normal population and put you into an autism diagnosis. At the same time, we are finding these de novo mutations which do have very, very dramatic effects. And this is my interpretation of what the big picture of autism looks like. The common variation is there. If you have enough common variation, some people will also have a de novo mutation which can carry them over the edge to lead to a diagnosis of autism. Now, I'm not making the suggestion here that everyone with autism has a de novo mutation. I, I don't think that's true. But I think everyone with a de novo mutation does have common variation, which is making them pushed in the right direction. When we start combining epidemiological data, so looking at populations on a big scale, with genetic data, we can actually start to build this big picture. At the bottom, we see the common variation. So we think that about 50% of autism comes from these very small common variants, each of individually very, very small effect. And remember, that to date, we don't have a single example of one of those. In contrast, a very, very small contribution of 3% comes from de novo mutations. None additive would, for example, be a recessive variant, so one of those homozygous ones where both copies are affected. That's about 4%. And then we think there is a small contribution from rare inherited, but as I said, it's not very well defined. 41% is unaccounted in this model. Now, often that's referred to as environment. It doesn't mean environment in the sense which we mean it, and therefore I've left it, left it as unaccounted. It could be de novo mutations we've not found. It could be interactions between different genes. It could be just sheer random chance. So here we start to have a model of what autism looks like at the population level. But unfortunately, interpreting this is quite difficult. This model is created from the total population. Now, when we start thinking about autism, we're not really that interested in thinking about it in the total population. We want to understand why do the people who are cases have autism. So this is work where I created a, essentially a computer simulation which simulates these genetic variants. We understand them very well. We understand how they're inherited. We understand when a de novo mutation arises. And by, trying, by working to fit the model, to that published picture, so this is the published data, this is the result of my simulation. Now, it is absolutely identical because the simulation is working on things we understand well. The reason I did this was because I wanted to ask a question which I cannot at the moment ask in, in humans. And that is, what if I only looked at these variants in the 1% of the population who was affected with autism? What I see there is that all of those factors still play a role but the distribution has shifted. Common variation is still very important, maybe the biggest category, affecting about a quarter. But now de novo mutations are also affecting a quarter, as are rare inherited variation, and there's still a, a proportion which we just don't understand. This is important because this fits with our clinical experience much better. If I was to go into an autism clinic, 
and use my sequencing and microarray technologies, I would find these de novo mutations in at least 10% and maybe 15%. And so this tallies much better with the diagram on the right. And remember, these two plots were created from exactly the same simulation. And so this, I think, shows the unification of these two models. As you start to tend towards the extreme of a trait, the frequency, the impact of rare and de novo mutations increases, even though in the general population, these effects are very, very small. And I want to show a nice, easily understood example, which I think shows this perfectly. If I was to, instead of thinking about autism as a trait and talk about height, something which is much easier to conceptualize, we would see this trait distributed just like this. If someone's on the far right, we would refer to them as tall. On, on the left, we would refer to them as short. But if I go to the far, far extreme, to the tallest people and to the shortest people, then we actually define their sometimes as being a disorder. For example, Marfan's is associated with very tall stature, whereas achondroplasia is associated with being very, very short. Both of those disorders are driven by de novo mutations, even though we know that height is broadly an effect of common variants and the environment. And I think this fits very nicely with the autism model. As you head towards the extreme, you see this enrichment for de novo mutations, and that's how these models fit together. So let's try and put this all together. So far, we have identified the tip of the iceberg. I've tried to show this with a literal iceberg. For about 7% of de novo loss of functions in CNVs, or about 7% of cases who come into the clinic, I can identify a very clear, well-recognized autism locus. And that is our tip here, the top 7%. In about another 4%, I can find hints towards a locus, but I can't get it down to the single gene. We know that there are other de novo mutations playing a role, but we don't know exactly which ones they are. And so that's the 11% below the waterline. But then we add, add on to the bits which we really do not genuinely understand. There is clearly a contribution from rare variants. There are, very, uh, to my no, mind, no clear um, examples of what those are. For common variants, we don't know any, but I think that's going to change in the near future. And then there's undoubtedly a contribution which we just don't understand at the moment, which may involve gene-gene interactions, gene-environment interactions, environment in the truest sense. It might also involve just random chance or something like paternal age. But this, at the moment, is where I think the field is. Now, you could look at this and say it is somewhat depressing. Out of the total genetic variation which matters, there is 7% which we can claim we understand. And certainly, I think a compelling answer to this is that we need to do more work in understanding this and that geneticists should be paid more. Um, and that's a completely unbiased effect. But I think the key thing here is, even though we need to find more, this 7% is not just a random 7%. It's the 7% of genes with the strongest effect of autism. And that 7% is enough to give us our first ent entree into the biology of autism. So that's the claim. I'm going to try and offer some data to back this up. If I take the 65 genes which I've identified today and start thinking about how they interact, so, for example, which proteins tend to bind together? I find that they form a clump. In fact, they form a clump more than you would expect by chance, suggesting that there is meaningful biological interactions between them. Within this clump, there are two subclumps or subnetworks. And these, you, when you look at the genes involved, have two very clear patterns. On the left, we have chromatin regulation. This is the very essence of development. It tells cells what they should be, where they should be, how they should act. On the right, we have the synaptic module. This is all about communication between neurons in the brain. I was certainly not the first to make this distinction, but I think this has been the important emerging biology coming from this sequencing technology. Now, the synapse was not a surprise. In fact, I've been well recognized for many, many years. The chromatin module we did not find until we took these unbiased genomic approaches. And I think that's been one of the most critical things because you can see that chromatin module is bigger. If we start then trying to integrate that data with other data sets, we can start to build an emerging picture of what autism is like from a neurobiological point of view. The first work has started off with those 65 genes and started thinking about it in the context of the developing human brain. 
by looking at where these genes are expressed, the patterns of that expression, what we find is there are two critical periods. The first one happens during mid-fetal development, about sort of week 16 to maybe 28 in utero. We find there that those chromatin genes seem to be particularly key. We're not really sure what they're doing, but they're doing something very important at that stage. That's not to say the synaptic ones are not involved. They seem to also be playing a role in that early network. Some great work done by these uh, individuals and, and papers on the right has actually honed this down to specific cell types, particularly glutamatergic neurons in the prefrontal cortex and medium spiny neurons in the striatum. Now, from a practical point of view, I think this is a really key observation. Because now, when we start thinking about neuroscience, if we hand a neuroscientist the animal and say, look, here's the gene, go and work out what the biology is, the brain is so complex, it is almost impossible to know what's the right experiment. Once you can start honing down and saying, you need to be looking in mid-fetal development, in the prefrontal cortex, in glutamatergic neurons, that massively constrains the number of hypotheses which need to be tested. I don't think this is the sole picture of biology, but it certainly seems to be an important module within it. There's a second critical period which seems to happen between birth and infancy. Whether this is an extension of the first one or genuinely a separate entity is not clear at the moment. Somehow, these modules need to lead to some kind of persistent change in the brain. If we understood what that persistent change in the brain is, we would be very well placed to start thinking about what treatments might look like, look like. And you could really argue that our role as geneticists is trying to get to the stage of understanding what those brain changes are. We've seen a little bit of hint coming from post-mortem work um, done by these two papers here. <clears throat> and what they find is that this, these same synaptic genes are down-regulated. There's less of them expressed in the brain than you would expect by chance. They also see an upregulation of immune cells called microglia. It is unclear whether those effects are causal or are the consequence of autism, though. If we pick some of the genes which we found from our screening, and I'm going to show you here CHD8. CHD8 was one of the top two, two genes found from this work on the exome. We find that CHD8, which is a chromatin regulator, directly regulates the other genes which are regulating chromatin and autism. So CHD8 is the regulator of regulators. And I think this is probably the reason why it was one of those top two genes. It also has an indirect effect on the, on the synaptic genes. And what I mean by indirect is it doesn't bind to them, but if you look in a mouse model where the CHD8 has been knocked out, those synaptic genes are also downregulated. And if we look at fragile X, which is arguably the first really bona fide gene discovered in autism, we find that fragile X gene interacts with both the chromatin and the synaptic genes. And so we're starting to see this emerging picture of everything converging onto downstream neurobiology. And I think looking at this, there is a, a clear hypothesis which emerges, and that is that the chromatin genes are regulating the synaptic ones. And those synaptic genes then go on to lead to the persistent neurobiology. This, at the moment, remains a hypothesis. Certainly, I've not seen data which convinces me that it's true. You could argue it's back to front. What if the synaptic genes alter neurodevelopment, which then changes the way the genes are regulated? Equally possible. But the key thing is that by following these genes, by looking at how they interact biologically, we've been able to make some progress in understanding how these fit together. I'd like to end by um, talking about the other top gene. So this is um, in 2012, when we first worked out this technique of gene discovery from the exome data, there was one gene which popped out. At this stage, we only had, I think, about 15 mutations. We now have in the order of hundreds. But even in these 15, two of them were in the same gene. This gene here, sodium channel um, 2-alpha, or SCN2A. On the right is a statistical model which demonstrates that in this data set, those two mutations alone were sufficient to say this was an autism-associated gene. As a scientist, you always want to see these things replicated. And encouragingly, there it is. Two years later, there was the paper published by the ASC looking at an independent data set and again found these de novo mutations clustering in the gene SCN2A. So this is the channel. It's 
This is the protein which comes out of the SCN2A uh, DNA. The, cha the channel is called NAV1.2, and the reason for that being that it was sort of it, it was found by the sodium people working on this rather than by the geneticists. So each of us has chosen a different name. Just makes life a bit easier. This channel sits in the membrane of the cell. Specifically, it sits in the membrane of glutamatergic excitatory neurons in the cortex. You can see there's these, um, these cylinders. Those are called the transmembrane domains. They sit between the inside and the outside of the cell. Between them is this loop which ends in the big black dot. That is the pore. So that essentially is a gap in the channel which allows sodium to pass. I'm going to I'm going to use my pointer. I was trying to avoid using this, but I think the time has come. So up here, this is what the channel looks like. These four repeats, one, two, three, four, form a circle like this, to form which has a hole in the middle, and that hole is where sodium passes to get into or out of the cell. In the centre of that pore, we have these black dots. Those represent four amino acids. Each one of those is held in the perfect uh, arrangement to create an e electron density field which fits sodium perfectly. And this is why it forms a selective sodium channel. So we started thinking, where do these mutations lie? Now, in the paper which, um, which replicated this finding, a really keen observation was made. Three de novo missense mutations were very, very close to those four amino acids which are at the center of the pore. Now, a missense mutation doesn't completely disrupt the gene. Instead, it changes just one out of the 2,000 amino acids which make up this gene. But if you change an amino acid which is critical, then it's, it arguably will have a similar effect to a loss of function variant. And the idea that three of these seem to be in close proximity to the, the very heart of this molecule suggested that maybe something was going on. But there was another mystery with this. When you, when you find a gene like this, the first thing you go and do is say what's been published before. What you want to find is that no one has ever mentioned this in autism. You're the first one to see it, but it's clearly expressed in the brain and obviously has the right kind of effects that you want. What you don't want to see is that someone has already associated it with a different neurological disorder which your patient doesn't have. And that was exactly what we saw here. We, it had been strongly associated with infantile seizures. So these are seizures which happen before the age of one year and often lead to very, very severe developmental delay. Looking at the evidence for that, it was extremely strong. There was no question it was the wrong association. But when we looked at our patients who had autism, none of them had seizures before the age of 12 months. So this created something of a mystery. There were other mysteries. I've shown before that um, these autism genes cluster into a chromatin group, which tends to affect the, affect the cell body, and a synaptic group, which affects the dendrites where the communication takes place. SCN2A is not in this uh, domain, despite being our gene with the best evidence for autism association. Instead, it hits this region here called the axon initial segment. This is where an action potential is created in a nerve. So nerves need to fire. SCN2A is at, located at the place where that firing takes place, and in fact, is responsible for that firing. But the mystery gets further. It is responsible for that firing when you are young, specifically before the age of one year. As you go, get, grow older, so after the age of one year, SCN2A is replaced by SCN8A and becomes relegated to a much more minor effect. That effect might still be important, but it no longer is the sole reason for action potentials being generated. Now, this observation has some clinical importance. If I take those people who are having early seizures, they actually fall into two groups. One group has very severe seizures and goes on to have severe developmental problems. The other group has seizures, and then around the age of one year, the seizures go away and they have no problems, which is a very unusual pattern. In fact, I can't think of any other gene which really causes that pattern. And the reason for that is, at the age of one year, SCN2A is replaced by SCN8A, and therefore that, that seizure agenesis has gone away. So there are several features that make this gene remarkable. Firstly, it's one of the top genes. 
If we could understand this, we'd be a long way towards understanding what autism is. Secondly, it causes a second phenotype, epileptic encephalopathy, which is the severe seizures, or benign infantile seizures, which are the ones which resolve. We see an excess of these missense mutations, a characteristic we don't really see in any other gene. We also see two of these de novo mutations hitting exactly the same place. And we went through and checked it was different people many, many times. We don't see that anywhere else in the entire collection. And then finally, it targets a different region of the neuron to every other gene we found in autism. So all in all, something of a mystery. So following the observation in the Derubius paper, we started thinking, well, where do these mutations lie? Firstly, many of the ones we see in autism are loss of function. That's shown by the blue dots. Now, a loss of function mutation, it doesn't really matter where you are in the gene, you're going to have the same effect. The key thing is there were lots of them. If we look at the missense mutations, these are the ones which only affect a single amino acid out of the 2,000, we found that those cluster very, very near the pore, just as had been seen before. In fact, we now found an extra four, maybe five mutations, and we started seeing these mutations hitting exactly the same amino acid, an observation which had almost never happened by chance. And so we can draw these red lines on it. There seem to be these risk areas of the gene which make it particularly susceptible to autism. If we then start doing the same for the epileptic encephalopathy variants, we find that those cluster in different locations. Specifically, they cluster around the four and five transmembrane domains. And the four one is particularly important because that is the voltage sensor. And so when you start thinking about a, a channel which is misbehaving, if you're affecting the pore, which is the heart, or the voltage sensor, those seem to be the areas most likely to have a significant effect. So if I take these green bars and compare them with the red bars, you can see that they don't overlap. And so this led us to a hypothesis, and that was that the autism mutations are causing a loss of function. They're stopping the channel from working. Whereas the um, infantile seizure mutations are causing a gain of function. They're making the, the channel just very, very sensitive, and so it, it essentially opens very, very readily. And so conveniently, I, I walked across the uh, courtyard at UCSF and met Kevin Bender, who is a very, very talented electrophysiologist, who, with funding from the Simons Foundation, was able to start looking at this in, animal, um, in a cell model. And this is really the, the sort of nutshell of the results. We found that in autism, every single mutation we looked at resulted in loss of function. They did it in a variety of different ways, but all of them resulted in the same effect. And in fact, when you take that loss of function, it altered the excitability of the cell. So if you look in the top left here, black is what you expect to see, regular spikes coming from the cell. All of the colors below that are the different mutations we saw in autism, and we've condensed many of them into this PTV category. All of them result in less spikes. Essentially, the neuron is less excitable. That's in the developing before the age of one year, if you look on the, on the top right, you can see that that starts to resolve around the age of one year. And so a simplistic interpretation of this would be that any effect this is having on biology is likely to be taking place before the age of one year. We don't completely know that, and there's still a chance that actually the, the other role of SCN2A later in development still plays a role, but this at the moment is our working hypothesis. At the bottom, we see the effects of the infantile seizures. BIFs are the infantile seizures which resolve. We see here that the, uh, the spikes become more frequent, fitting with this idea of being more excitable. But if we go over to the right, you see that resolves by the age of one year, exactly as you'd expect in a symptom which resolves. Whereas at the bottom, we see the most severe ones of these, where we see these very intense spikes which do not resolve completely at the age of one year. And that then fits again with this idea of developmental delay. So from this single gene, we actually have got some very important insights into autism. Firstly, we see it as affecting glutamatergic neurons, the same neurons targeted by our systems analysis. Secondly, we see it as seems to be having an impact before the age of one year. Again, exactly the same result we got from the systems analysis. We also find that this one gene is causing these two completely different clinical manifestations, and we can, we can actually predict which one of those it's going to go. 
And so this also suggests that some of the circuitry involved in both autism and in infantile seizures must overlap since it's caused by a common gene. And so I'd like to end just by thinking about you know, where, do, where do we go from this? When we were looking at Mendelian disorders, it was seen as one of the greatest strengths was you found one gene and one gene only, and that made the downstream work easier. In autism, the opposite is true. We find 65 genes, and we find that all of them are contributing risk. And we actually predict there's near enough 1,000. We then have the challenge of trying to make progress in downstream biology. And what we see is these genes, each of which has many, many different effects. And I've tried to show those effects by this idea of arrows, each one pointing towards a different aspect of biology. The trouble is each of these genes does many, many different things. And it's very difficult to know which of those functions is going to be the important one. SCN2A is really one of the easiest because we really know what sodium channels do. If you take a gene like CHD8, which is a chromatin regulator, it seems to just do a myriad of different things. So the question then becomes, how do you try and get from these individual genes to an understanding of biology, particularly in a disorder which we're not completely convinced we can replicate in a mouse model? And what I'd like to argue is that actually that large number of genes is actually a strength. If you can work out the point where these genes come together, the points of convergence across them, the reason why SCN2A and CHD8, which on the face of it are such different genes, if we can just understand what those both do together, it'll be at those points where the true biology of autism emerges. And hopefully that will be the way of trying to understand how we can offer therapeutic interventions. So in summary, the key points, genetics, the whole point of it is not to try and find every last variant. I, I honestly don't think we will ever be able to do that. What we want is the entree into biology. We want to find enough of the key starting points to be able to fully understand the downstream biology. Genomics, looking at the big picture of genetics, has allowed us to find robust ASD gene discovery. I, I think after cancer, you could argue it is the disorder where we've seen the greatest benefit of these new technologies. I think it is a matter of time until common variants follow, and I think that's going to be a critical result. If we integrate epidemiology and genetics together, we've actually managed to start to build a big picture view of how autism is, uh, sort of manifests at a genetic level. And this has helped us to start thinking about what's the next logical experiments. But most importantly, if we take the genes we find, by looking at what they have in common, and also by following each one in detail and trying to understand what they share, that allows us to get an understanding of what the biology might be. And already from this, we've seen this idea of mid-fetal development and also the importance of neuronal excitability in glutamatergic neurons. I would like to end with just thanking um, some of the people who've worked here. Genetics, uh, the, the autism community, I think, is an extremely collaborative one. And so when I start thinking about people who have, have um, really helped me in this story which I've shown you today, I really represent a very, very small cog in a very large uh, and I think relatively well-functioning machine. This is a network which you can get if you search for autism genetics uh, through PubMed. It shows it's um, brought together by people who publish together. Uh, and one of the really great things of this field is just look how many lines there are. This is a field which is working together well. We do see the, the different colors were created by uh, looking for clusters of collaboration. They somewhat represent institutions and countries, but even the different clusters are caught, brought together quite nicely. And so really the work I've, I've shown you today is, is the, the sort of the output of this wonderful field. But in my local network, I would particularly like to thank uh, Matthew State, who is my supervisor and now chair of department, Bernie and Catherine are some amazingly gifted statisticians who really have been critical to every discovery we've made. Mike Tulkowski has been working with me on the whole genome sequencing, uh, which we think is a, a very embryonic stage, but a very exciting direction. And Kevin Bender did the exquisite work on electrophysiology with the SCN2A mutations. And in my lab, Donna and June uh, have been really leading this whole genome discovery effort and just done a huge amount of work. The two most important thank yous, of course, go firstly to the Simons Foundation for funding to make this possible, but most importantly to the families. Uh, without people giving us their DNA, their information, and taking the brave step of being involved, none of this would have been possible. Thank you for listening.